Thank you, Stephanie. It's absolutely necessary that a nation have a budget. And for three years in a row now, the Democratic Party has produced. We should be thankful that this is a more honest budget than we've seen for a long, long time. We should also be thankful it's a more responsible budget because now we can finally look forward to a return of statutory PAYGO, that budget device that worked so well from 1990 to 2002. But I view all of this as just a first step. We have many other problems that we need to help the Obama administration address. We have entitlement and tax issues that are huge in comparison to the size of the federal budget. So I hope that this is a confidence-building step that we can use to tackle the larger issues. In uh, the year 2000, revenue and expenditures as a percentage of the GDP were both around 19%. That's the last time we broke even. Since that time, there has not been a year where expenditures have been less than 20% and revenue as much as 19% of GDP. Statutory PAYGO is a large part of restoring the ability of this country to, to, to do the responsible thing. This is not rocket science. Let me tell you, we either figure out how to pay our bills that our society wants uh, expenditures to be uh, expended on, or the international creditors someday are going to come in here and do it for us. And if you think this is hard for the American people to do, then wait someday in the future. It's not if, but when the international credit market says, I've had enough. And this America is what you're going to do. That's the day we lose our economic freedom. This is a step in the right direction for us to have the will to either pay for what we demand from our government or just to go without it. It's not, it's not hard, and it's, not, it's, it's hard, it's difficult to do, but it's not complex. We either get our own house in order. 75% of the money we've borrowed this decade has come from international creditors. It's not, again, it's not if, it is when they say enough is enough, America. And that's when we lose our economic freedom. That's why the blue dog, this would be an easy job if we didn't care so much about uh, what things cost and just hit the credit card for it to be a whole lot easier to sleep at night. Anyway, thank you all for being here. This is really important. This is important to you and to our country. We'd be happy to take any questions of any of the, if you want to direct them to any of the members. Uh, thank you. And looking ahead to the statute that you're, this is for anyone, um, looking ahead to the statute that you're going to write, going to work on with the Senate and the administration, how important is it that uh, you we return to a, a PAYGO system that you referenced in the 90s, which was done on a year-by-year -year basis, versus one similar to the one we have now in the rule that allows for a five- or a ten-year window in which we can get back to uh, a, a revenue-neutral place over the longer term? And then how important is that difference, at all, if at all? I have stumped everyone. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to find blue dogs to answer that. Jim, you want to? You were here. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important that we walk before we run. We've had great difficulty getting either the House or the Senate to agree on statutory pickup. Um, the tighter the restriction, the better, in my opinion. It's just speaking for myself. Uh, part of it depends on the nature of the legislation. For example, with health care reform, which is a giant task we are planning on undertaking. That should be revenue neutral, in my opinion, for the first year of full implementation. That's several years from now. So it will depend on the piece of legislation. A one year appropriation, that should be paid for um, in a short term fashion. A longer term bill should be paid for over the, usually we have a five or ten year budget window. But the tighter the restriction, the better, because if you allow people leeway, they will take advantage of it. Let me just say on that, not from the Blue Dog standpoint, I'm not speaking to the Blue Dogs at this point in time. But I think I do speak for the speaker and myself and the committee chairman as well. We put our country in a real hole. Uh, in 
and we have very substantial problems confronting us. So uh, we're prepared to take a substantial step. It may not be the perfect step, and I think that's what everybody here is saying. We haven't taken the perfect step, uh, but a step that gets us back on the road to fiscal health uh, and fiscal responsibility is really our objective. So the question you ask is, is the perfect going to be the enemy of the good? And I think the answer to that from a leadership standpoint would be no. I think the Blue Dogs will push, as Mr. Cooper has said, for the most uh, toughest. But also, and, and Alan Boyd gave you the word practical, I think we're going to have to sort of balance the tough with the practical and the doable and the passable. After all, what we want is a law. So we're going to work with the administration, we're going to work with the Blue Dogs, we're going to work with the Senate uh, in trying to get a uh, legislation that will be uh, uh, passable. Mr. Hoyer, um, the last two years, the Senate has rolled the House over and over again on PAYGO, whether it be the AMG, whether it be the GI Bill benefits, et cetera. You sent this letter. What's, what's the, your sense of why this letter is going to hold up this year in negotiations with the Senate any more than past statements? that Democrats have made in the House saying that they wanted to make sure that AMT was paid for, make sure the GI Bill benefits a big expansion and the <coughs> benefits was paid for. I think there is a very significant and real difference. The President of the United States is for Pegu. That was not the case uh, in the Bush administration. It was not the case in the Bush administration because they knew they couldn't pay for their cuts in revenues. I don't quibble with anybody who wants to cut taxes. I think all of us want to cut taxes. But we don't want to cut taxes and have our children pay for it. If we cut taxes, then we ought to cut our spending. We ought to cut our programs. Uh, life's a series of trade-offs. But if you don't make the trade-offs and just create the debt, then your children pay the bill. So uh, I think this very significant difference is the President of the United States has, in conversations with the Blue Dog leadership, uh, and uh, frankly, I've had conversations with him as well. We've had conversations in the leadership. This is something he believes in. This is not a political stratagem for the president. It is a, it's a policy judgment that he has made that is necessary. So I think the difference is the president of the United States uh, is going to be working towards the same end we are. Um, Leader Hoyer, um, to what extent do you have any concerns about this is the Blue Dog <coughs> press conference? <I> <laughs> That's our. <coughs> Um, we, we're happy for you to ask him for that commitment. <laughs> <laughs> to what extent are you worried about the role that the OMB and its scorekeeping would play under a statutory PAO? And also, how do you respond to criticisms that this budget was, was sort of a, Obama promised one thing, you guys gave another in terms of like, say, some bipartisan support on things like Medicare Part B or farm payments or some of the SGR and AMT stuff. That, well, well, I have to this isn't as honest as what Obama came out with. Uh, we deal in the art of the possible, the art of the 218 and 51 or 60. Uh, in this case, 51 on the budget in the Senate. Uh, and that's what we dealt with, and that's what Senator Conrad had to deal with. Um, but I think this is, uh, as, as I think uh, Mr. Boyd said, Congressman Boyd said, uh, certainly uh, one of the most honest budgets that we've had. Uh, it's not dishonest in the sense but what you're saying is it doesn't affect some of the things, frankly, that I would have supported that was sent down by President Obama. Um, but uh, they didn't have uh, broad enough support to be sustained. But uh, with respect, what was the first guy? Uh, the role of OMB. Okay, let me take a With respect to OMB, there, there was a discussion I had with the chairman of the Budget Committee on the Senate side with reference to that issue. Uh, very frankly, I think. Uh, whether it's OMB or CBO, uh, following their judgment. They may differ in their judgment, but uh, following either one is a step forward. <laughs> so uh, getting mired in the argument of whether it's OMB or CBO uh, is, is somewhat a distraction because whether it's CBO giving the limits or OMB giving the limits, even if they might be different, Living within those limits is the critical objective. Yes, sir. Last question. On the entitlement reform. How much time do we have to vote? Does anybody have a question? Six minutes. Five, six minutes. Okay. 
it doesn't seem like there's any step on the entitlement reform in the budget, and I wonder if you can talk to why you weren't able to get anything on that, um, even the first step on and moving the process forward. Do you want? Well, I, I'll make a comment. Step. Let, let me make a comment on that. I am uh, one, as you may know, testified uh, before uh, Senator Conrad and Senator Gregg on their proposal. Mr. Cooper and Mr. Wolf also had a proposal. Uh, I think both have great merit. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with every particular provision, but the concept of having a, a, a group look at the entitlement issue and reporting back to the Congress and requiring the Congress to act on that. Very tough to do, but absolutely essential in my opinion. Uh, the current situation is not sustainable uh, over the uh, long term. Uh, not because anybody's done anything wrong per se, uh, but because the demographics uh, of our society are such that they are changing. And uh, in order for us to sustain these three critically important entitlements. I think all of us are very committed to Social Security. We're committed to making sure that those who uh, don't have the ability can get, get health care, uh, Medicaid, speaking of, and that seniors uh, have availability of health insurance for them, which has literally brought millions and millions and millions of seniors out of poverty. <coughs> Social Security and Medicare together have uh, provided uh, base for millions and millions of seniors. But uh, on entitlements, I think uh, the President has indicated he believes that's important. He originally discussed about doing that in his budget. He made a determination that that would not facilitate the passage of his budget, as you heard. Uh, but I, I personally, speaking for myself, believe that is a very important objective uh, for us to pursue. And I'm sure that I'll be working with the, uh, with the Blue Dogs towards that end. Let me take a short stab at this again. Uh, yeah. Both of these issues, entitlement reform and, and pay goals, are heavy issues, a uh, heavy lift. And uh, we wanted to focus on statutory pay goal because that's uh, the, what the Blue Dogs uh, really believe in. But we also believe uh, in entitlement reform as well. But the, for me personally, the reason why we didn't take on entitlement. Uh, and I don't know if I, I don't speak for the other Blue Dogs, but is, is to t take the heavy lift on the uh, statutory pay goal. Let me, I, 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 yeah. um, healthcare reform is entitlement reform, uh, and that's addressed in the budget. Now, as it relates to the specific vehicle outside of regular order, whether it's a task force or a commission uh, that's been advocated both by Mr. Cooper on the House side, uh, Chairman Conrad on the Senate side, point of focus in the President's Fiscal Summit earlier this year in a working group that some of us were involved in. Uh, that is still being worked out uh, with the White House, with leadership, with members who are interested in addressing this issue, uh, both for additional steps necessary uh, for health care, but also for Social Security. I think that, as, as Barron just said, and the point that I made to Chairman Conrad, the longer the Blue Dogs and others in the House have to keep rewaging a battle to reinstitute something that was in place in the 1990s, uh, the less likely uh, we're going to be able to make progress on these other fronts. We have to get back in place what we all lived with a decade ago uh, before we be able, were able to get uh, the concentrated support, again working with the White House, behind a different type of vehicle outside of regular order to enact entitlement reform. We can't do everything in this budget. We bit off a lot in this budget resolution, uh, but a lot is still going on as it relates to what we want to do longer term for entitlement reform, and the Blue, Do Blue Dogs are a part of that discussion. I want to make, before we leave, I want to go back to your question about uh, the Senate examiners and what's different, what's better. I hope, I hope you've seen the letter that the Speaker and the majority leader wrote. Uh, to me, it's stronger than language that you could get uh, probably in uh, in a budget resolution. A budget resolution is not uh, a force of law, as you know. It's not a statute. And uh, you couldn't actually do statutory pay go in the budget resolution. All you can do is create leverage to try to get statutory pay go. And that letter provides us the, the greatest leverage that we can have. So I'll make sure that you Although, although the letter does have only four bills, it doesn't have health care, it doesn't have energy. There's other things that could come. I, I would remind you 
that the house had a that, that PAYCO rule in place that they would have to be paid for if they came, or either that rule would have to be waived. Thank you.